What topic in the year 2020 is more timely than writing in adversity? And I think this is on all of our minds and hearts right now as creative artists so much that I've heard a couple different people just kind of bringing up naturally as part of discussion so far. Um, we're going to talk in three parts. First part, we're going to cover common reactions that we have as artists to adversity. And when I say as artists, we're going to cover poets today. We're going to cover oh. writers in general today. Uh, but also a lot of oh. this can apply to any creative endeavor that you do. Second up, we are going to look at how famous writers of the past have dealt hey. with adversity. And third, we are going to look at solutions to a creative slump. Um, as I think Deborah pointed out, it is possible that some of you are more prolific than ever during these challenging times. But if you were like Point. me, <laughs> you have not been as prolific as ever. And so we're going to talk about what to do when you are in your creative winter. Uh, this talk is meant to be normalizing and reassuring and wherever you are right now with your writing is okay. So anytime that you see these little bubbles with the let's talk, that is your cue to uh, do a little chat boxing. And let's talk here about what adversities or challenges have you faced in the last 12 months. Go ahead and write that in the chat box. I'm sure we're all going to put COVID-19, <laughs> but besides that, it can be big or small, what you write down. It can be something as simple as, you know, I had to move houses. And hun, as answers are rolling in, could I have you go ahead and uh, read mm. off some of what people are saying the challenges are that they're facing? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so that you can be heard or you can just project really loud and I think my mic will pick you up. Okay. Oh! Sorry, guys. <clears throat> okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up if you can, my friends. No? Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, I'm seeing everything from isolation and too much distance from people to eye problems like a detached retina. I can relate. I have diabetic retinopathy, so that makes it difficult. The need for exercise and stress relief and getting an injury. Uh, burnout, because if somebody has an at-home job that involves a lot of writing, um, not being able to meet face to face, um, coffee clutch, I, sounds Yiddish. <laughs> I'm not sure quite what that means. It's, I, it's a I, Deborah I'm, term and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Deborah, but that is, uh, a gathering of hearts and minds and beverages. Okay. <laughs> Limited travel. Steven, this sounds like a lot of um, um, that a lot of these things, the isolation and limited travel, face to face contact are um, leads to a lack of inspiration, I think. Mm. Um, right, yeah, some people can't leave their homes until there is a vaccine. Um, illness of a loved one. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with that too. Um, Missing family and friends, uh, keeping keeping a spouse healthy if they happen to be ill. Um, yeah. That's a great sampling, and please do continue to uh, chat in the chat box as we go. Um, yeah, what I am hearing there is a lot of themes of the feeling of isolation and being stuck. I heard lots of others, but definitely that's what came across strongest to me. Um, whatever adversity you are facing, we can see that there's lots of variety. Our adversities can be internal or external. It could be temporary. 
Uh, we hope this pandemic is temporary um, or it could be ongoing. Also, um, our adversities can be shared or personal. This is not meant to be only a workshop about COVID-19, any adversity in your life. And when you talk about shared or personal, like a personal adversity might be like a personal illness. A shared adversity might be something like we have seen <coughs> this summer with the murder of George Floyd and how that has really brought to light the injustices to the Black community. That is right there, a shared adversity, which is unfortunately lifelong. Um, so that's shared by many different people. So I really enjoyed, it was very calming to me to try to look at artists current and of the past and how they have dealt with adversity. And so I kind of grouped them into five different types of responses. You may come up with another one, uh, but the five responses that I found were process, that we use our art to process what is happening to us in that bad situation. Example, I have a stressful day at work, uh, have a disagreement with a coworker, so I go home and I journal, 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 journal all about what I'm feeling and possible solutions. I am using my art to process that situation. And sometimes I don't know what I feel or what I think until I can use my art and hammer that out. Another common reaction that we have is to fix. We're using our art to fix that problem. And so that could be we're calling for change. We are calling to highlight a social issue, an injustice, maybe to make money because money's our problem. Or uh, maybe you created your own problem. You are having a fight with a significant other. And so you use your art to create a beautiful apology and love poem and uh, send that along. And so using your art to fix that problem. And next up, we might use our art to preserve and preserve that situation itself as a record of that situation. And the main thing that I am seeing is the difference between process and preserve is when we process something, it's more internal. You are your own main audience. It's in the moment. It's working through it in the moment. Whereas preserving is you are writing for a future audience. It may be yourself, but it may be posterity. And it is to then be able to look back on that situation in the past. And the next type of response is escape. Like, please let me think about anything but this problem that I am dealing with. Um, it's a form of distraction, mental engagement. Often the subject matter is completely disconnected from whatever problem we're going through. Uh, fantasy is a key example of escapism, but it is not the only example. Um, I know, for example, those of you who raise your hand like to do forum poems, like the really detailed, like it needs this number of syllables or palindrome poems. Um, anything that is highly mentally engaging that way. And uh, this actually, it resets your brain. Um, Spike and I both work with kids. And so we went to a workshop on ACEs, that's adverse childhood experiences. And one of the techniques that they had us do, they said, if you have a child who is really emotionally worked up and that you need to calm them down, you can engage sure. them physically and have them count. And so they had us, you know, wave a hand in the air and count to one, wave another hand one. in the air, count to two, and then, you know, three and four and so on. And just switching over to something different actually starts to reset the brain. And as we did this exercise, like everybody in the room could just kind of feel themselves start to reset and calm down. So that's the other effect that escaping has with our art. And the last response that's common I found was avoid. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not creating right now. <laughs> Anybody relate to this one right now? Okay, not as many people as I thought, but you know what? It's okay if this is where you are. <laughs> it is absolutely okay. And that could be because other things need to take priority. Maybe your emotional needs, maybe all your energy is going somewhere else. Um, you may come up with other categories besides what I've listed here. Feel free to put those in the chat box, but those are the five I came up with. Writing less now does not mean that you cannot write later. 
And you can relate to multiple types of reactions. I'm not telling you to pick one of these. And I'm a fixed type. I'm a preserved type. You can do all of these. So let's talk in the chat box. Have you ever created a poem, story, painting, song inspired by a challenge in your life? And go ahead and tell us a little bit about it in the chat box. If anyone prefers, you can unmute yourself and just tell us about it briefly. I'm a slow typer, so can I do that? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I've written several poems, um, basically uh, about life within disabilities, um, dealing with having been told since childhood that I've got you know, three to five years to live at, you know, from every doctor I've ever had. And yet, oh, by the way, I'm 57. So, woo, 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 woo. and then also, you know, less cheerful things like loss of my parents and things like that. But I think um, the challenges in life, uh, poetry definitely is my go to more than any other art form that I love. Poetry is how I both process and preserve those um, challenging times in my life. So thank you, Alice. If anyone else would prefer to speak aloud, you are welcome to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about it. For National Poetry Writing Month, I took on a project of writing a chapbook of uh, meeting with strangers having conversations with strangers. And I was asking them about sound words. My goal at the initial part of this project was to avoid COVID altogether. But every conversation I had with the 40 strangers I contacted during that month somehow worked into a COVID conversation. And I, I heard myself trying to Let's think about something else. Let's talk about something else. When I got down to writing the poem that was inspired by the conversation of people who talked about something entirely different, I found myself using COVID in, in my writing. And eventually when I came to the finished product or working toward the finished product, I specifically used COVID types of words like isolation or disease or virus, not necessarily having anything to do with COVID at all, maybe in, in something else within a conversation. But that was, um, I was surprised that that happened because I really never wanted to go there. I was so sick of it, um, but it was there. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like a little disease popping right out in my mm -hmm. writing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's interesting about the, the shared vocabulary with, with COVID bleeding over. Yeah. Um, let's pick one more example. How's the chat box looking, honey? Um, <clears throat> well, we're seeing um, a lot of different things. A lot of people talking about escape. Um, a lot of people with some really nice, I think, very healthy activities that help, like reading while listening to classical music. Um, I believe, Marlene, you meant um, you and your husband. Can everyone hear Spike okay? Yeah. No. Okay. No. Not really. A little louder, Sonny. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, Marlene had a great idea. Um, I, she and her husband read while listening to classical music. Um, Deborah, God love you, Deborah. Um, with the death of your best friend, um, letting the words tell you your feelings. That's exactly what we do in theater, actually, a lot of the time. On um, Facebook poems, mm -hmm. um, Mary, I've read a good deal of those, mm -hmm. they're good. Um, I think, Al Alice, you're talking about um, COVID and pervasive universal human pain and fear. Are you, are you talking about that being an inspiration or being something that hinders? 
you from writing. Uh, you're on mute still. Oh, both. Uh, what, what I was thinking about what um, Nancy was saying about her project, how COVID just kept coming into it. And my, my reaction to that was because COVID, it has this, it's a human universal, this pervasive fear and pain issue that COVID-19 has become for the entire human race, you know? So that's, that's what I meant by that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you for that summary. And please, you know, you are welcome to keep up a robust conversation in the chat box. Even if we cannot highlight everything you say, you will be able to see what each other are saying. I'm going to move over to the next question. Some of you already hit on some of this, but who has created a poem, story, painting, song to escape a challenge in your life? And why this uh, uh, beautiful laundry machine is up here is I did exactly this with Jenny Kalahar's marker. Uh, it was tech week for page and stage that spikes theater. And I don't know if any of you do theater, but when you get to trying to make sure that small children have their lines memorized in the final days, it's very stressful. <laughs> and so I was in the middle of errands. I'm like, I just need to sit down at the coffee shop and I was cruising Facebook and Jenny had posted about how she sent a permanent marker through her laundry and somehow miraculously it made it through with the cap still on and something in my head said yep I am writing about this marker and it's perilous journey through the machine and spent an hour doing a kind of spoof epic I felt so much better after that but that's my escapism story. So uh, in the chat box, please continue. And if any of you want to tell your escapism art story, uh, please unmute yourself. I think um, if I can jump in, uh, probably painting is more of my escape than um, poetry writing. Painting for me takes me, you know, into that artwork away from whatever the reality is. I can, you know, I'll be painting for hours and not realize that that much time has passed. So um, I would say that. And Dennis, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I, I, I think all of us would prefer to dwell on positivity, but sometimes it's not actually a choice of a preference. It just, you know, sometimes we just can't help but think about the, the more sad or negative things that are going on. <laughs> I tend to use um, journal writing as my catharsis uh, to escape or to uh, face the monster, so to speak. Um, you know, and the and I can remember the last time I did this, which prompted the spiritual writing retreat in the Zen monastery. I had to do that to wrap it up, but that was to uh, come to terms with I was in the wrong place in my job, and uh, you know had given it all that I could, my hundred and ten percent, and it, there wasn't a return investment and you know, all that goes along with all of that and realizing that it's time to move on, but you don't wanna move on, you don't wanna change, you know, how could you make it better? And all of those ideas being met with another blow. And um, so I, I tend to use journal writing because it's more conversant. Um, and then sometimes when I go back through my journals, I can extrapolate poems at a later time, but uh, the journal writing is much more of the art form that's cathartic for me, especially to escape, to step away and take on another set of eyes. Sure, thank you, Deborah. Uh, Spike has a quote that he would like to share with everybody. <clears throat> okay, um, can everyone hear me okay? Success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And those words were spoken by Winston Churchill. Oh, Winston. Love Winston, Love Winston Churchill. Uh, do continue to hold this discussion in the chat box. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving and talk about the seasons of creativity. So 
Uh, adversity can have opposing effects on people. Some of us are going to produce a lot more creativity wise. Some are going to produce a lot less. Some keep creating, they just switch modes and do it in a different way. And it's important to remember that creativity and productivity for a lot of us comes in cycles. I have met very few artists that could churn out the exact same number of words day after day for years on end. So you may be in the summer of your productivity. Ideas are coming quickly. You have a poem a day. You may be in the autumn where you are just reaping the harvest of what you have been working on, a lot of publications. Or you may be in the winter where you are staring at the snow white piece of paper and it is blank. Um, this is normal. Going through a winter of creativity doesn't mean that nothing is going on underground to prepare you for your next spring. In real life, there are certain types of fruit trees that have to have a winter in order to have a harvest the next year. As in, they literally have to have a certain number of days under 40 degrees or they don't have a crop. And so sometimes going through the bad stuff and giving yourself time to just process that situation, that's your winter before the spring. Whatever season you are in, it's okay. But later we will talk about what to do if you are in a creative winter that just won't end and you are tired of being in Narnia with the White Witch. <laughs> so part two. How famous writers responded to adversity. And this was just a lot of fun to research. We'll be doing both poets and some general writers. There are so many good ones. Uh, could I get a volunteer to read this journal entry aloud? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, Friday, April 8th, 10 minutes to 11 a.m., 1921. And I ought to be writing Jacob's room, and I can't. And instead, I shall write down the reason why I can't, this diary being a kindly, blank-faced old confidant. Well, you see, I'm a failure as a writer. I'm out of fashion, old, shan't do any better. I do not trouble uh, to sketch this in order, or how my temper sank and sank till after a half an hour, I was as depressed as I've ever been, as I ever am. I mean, I thought of never writing anymore, save reviews. What depresses me is the thought that I have ceased to interest people. I think the only prescription for me is to have a thousand interests. If one is damaged, to be able instantly to let my energy flow into Russian or Greek or the press or the garden or people or some activity disconnected with my own writing. Excellent, thank you, Mike. So first, let's acknowledge that we all face adversity at one time or another, and even famous writers may be stymied by the challenges in their lives for a while. Uh, guesses on who this is writing this passage. Is that Hemingway? Good guess. Virginia guessing. Woolf. Yeah, Virginia Woolf, you got it, yes, yeah. Yeah, this is Virginia Always. Woolf, 1921. And so uh, we know that she goes on after 1921 to do Mrs. Dalloway, 1925 to The Lighthouse, 1927, big, important, successful works. So indeed, it is not over for her, as she says. But I also want to acknowledge the adversity that she references here. And that's an adversity that she faces all her adult life. And that is some form of mental illness. She refers to that feeling of sinking. She refers to depression. And um, without making light at all in this hopefully overall hopeful conversation we're having here about uh, creativity and adversity, we do need to acknowledge that a couple decades from then, she did commit suicide. Um, and it was in part because of the mental illness. And I say this not to sadden you. Uh, if you are helpless, I do encourage you to seek help. But I also want to offer this hopeful truth. There are some adversities that we have our entire lives that we will never fully be without. And yet we, like Virginia Woolf, may still be able to create powerful art. 
I also appreciate here in this quote that Wolf is self-aware of what to do when she has writer's block, that I will instantly try the, the press or Greek or Russian or the garden or hanging out with people. Um, and she just journals about how she can't write. So she has some coping mechanisms in here that are very good. Uh, I'm gonna pause just a moment because I think that Spike had a comment for me. Um, no, is that the book that you were referencing? It's the Seasons of Creativity. It is not. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was trying to find it for you. <laughs> I, I found the blog post, and that might be one to since it's a sure. Drop it into book. the chat box and share okay. it. That'd be great. Okay. okay. All right, the next author that I really enjoyed reading about is Jean-Dominique Bobby, relatively modern. And he is a French journalist and editor of the fashion magazine Elle. At age 43, he suffers a massive stroke. He wakes up 20 days later in the hospital and he has what's called locked in syndrome. And so that means that his mental faculties are intact, but he can barely move. He can move his head a little and he can blink one eyeball. And in spite of this, he is able to dictate an entire book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And how this works, and you can see a little bit in the picture here, uh, the partner here is reciting the alphabet one letter at a time, and he blinks on the right letter. And so writing the book took over 200,000 blinks, and the average word took approximately two minutes to write. He passed away two days after the publication of his book. The Diving Bell and the Butterfly is a memoir describing Bobby's life before and after the stroke. The tone is anecdotal and philosophical and at times poetic. Here is a quote. But I see in the close a symbol of continuing life and proof that I still want to be myself. If I must drool, I may as well drool on cashmere. And I love this quote because it is referencing his life working for a fashion magazine and also uh, a way that you can cope with adversity, which is humor. Bobby is using his art both to process his current situation and to preserve, I'd say, not only the medical condition, but he's preserving himself. I also imagine that the sheer effort also provided purpose in a life that sadly some would say didn't have purpose anymore, but he is defying that sort of mentality and holding on to who he is. And then Little Women, Louisa May Alcott. She is of course most famous for Little Women, but she was prolific, wrote dozens of short stories and other books. We could go on at length at how parts of Little Women mirror parts of Alcott's own childhood. Uh, I am most interested in today's discussion on three adversities she faced. First, the death of Beth and Little Women. Uh, it does reflect the death of Louisa's real life sister, Lizzie. Alcott paints a touching portrait of an innocent little sister who does come to terms with her own mortality and spirituality. And it's interesting to note in real life that Alcott lost two sisters, including as an adult May, who was the basis for Amy. Second, Alcott served as a Civil War nurse. She contracted typhoid fever and nearly died. She wrote hospital sketches to preserve her experience and ask for change. So for example, she wrote of mismanaged hospitals and indifferent surgeons. And third, why I really picked Alcott is the issue of poverty, one of her biggest adversities. Her father, Branson Alcott was an idealist, but not very practical. Uh, he nearly drove the family to starvation in a quest to live in a utopian community called the Fruitlands. Uh, the fictional Mark family faced what we would call genteel poverty, but the real life Alcott family faced grueling poverty at times, living on bread and water for weeks or even months at a time. From the age of nine, Louisa's ambition was to lift her family out of poverty. She took all manner of jobs, laundress, teacher, nurse, ladies' companion, seamstress. Six days a week, she would sew and think up stories in her head, and then on Sunday, she would write those down. Now she's 35 when she writes Little Women and it became a rousing success. It was bigger than Dickens, uh, but she never quite felt financially secure. So here is a quote which I think sums this up well. 
Uh, money is the root of all evil. And yet it is such a useful root that we cannot get on without it any more than we can without potatoes. So Alka uses her art to try to fix the adversity in her life, writing for money to escape poverty. And I, I think there's a little doubt that she would have been writing anyway, uh, but it did sometimes shape what she chose to write. She said, quote, I don't write moral tales for the young because I enjoy it. I do it because it pays well. Alcott also used her art as a type of escapism. Her sensational stories, often published under a pseudonym, gave her an emotional and creative outlet. I'm going to pause here because I think Spike has something to say. Um, one of the more interesting parallels about um, Little Women and Louisa May Alcott's own life is if, if you're familiar with the book in, I believe, chapter 15 or 14, um, Joe sells her hair to help pay for her father's care after he's injured or become sick during the Civil War. Um, there is a direct parallel. Parallel: Louisa May Alcott contracted typhoid fever while she was a Civil War nurse and lost all her hair due to the mercury treatment she received. Mm -hmm. Thank you, honey. Next up is Horatio Spafford. He's an American lawyer and Presbyterian church leader, and within a two-year period, he suffered an onslaught of tragedies. In 1871, he lost most of his real estate investments in the Great Chicago Fire. A couple years later, his family planned a trip to Europe. Business demands, mostly a fallout from what he lost during the Great Chicago Fire, meant that he couldn't travel with his family. He was meant to catch up later. But what happened is that in 1873, the ship carrying his family was struck by an iron sailing vessel. It sank. It killed 226 people, including all four of Spafford's daughter. His wife, Anna, did survive, and she sent back a two-word telegram, saved alone. As Spafford sailed to England to join his wife, he wrote the words to what is now a well-known hymn, It is well with my soul. And this one is one of my favorites. I will not sing it for you, but the words are, when, uh, <laughs> did I have a volunteer for singing? <laughs> you! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will read it for you. Uh, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And if you're not familiar with this hymn, you too, but it's beautiful. So Spafford's adversity is sudden. It's extreme. He uses his art to cope, to make sense of the tragedy, and to connect to his spiritual and philosophical beliefs. To the outsider, these words seem to have a huge disconnect from the turmoil he must be going through. And yet I can imagine that in writing these words, it's almost a mantra. It's a way of soothing himself in the midst of the unimaginable. Here, the art is a therapy. Next up is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And she was a household name in the 1800s, but admittedly, I had not heard of her until I started researching her for work this summer. She is super cool. She was an abolitionist, suffragist, public speaker, teacher, and a talented writer in multiple genres. Harper was the first African-American woman to publish a short story. She also published a best-selling novel, Iola Leroy, in her 60s. It dealt with issues of discrimination, miscegenation, which today we'd call biracial marriage, and passing. At age 21, she published her first book of poetry, Forest Leaves. And by the way, interesting fact, we thought that this uh, book was lost to history until less than 20 years ago. They found one single copy, so we have that book now. Uh, unlike Spafford, his adversity came very suddenly. Harper's adversity was lifelong, and it was woven into the society that she was born into. Harper was born to free Black parents, but she faced discrimination throughout her life. A single example. So she left her home state to go to another state as a teacher. During that time, her home state of Maryland passed a law saying, okay, any free Black in the North 
can no longer enter our state of Maryland. If you do, you will be arrested and sold into slavery. So she could not return back home. Uh, basically what we can see Harper doing is using her art as a call to change. And she stood up and wrote about rights for African-Americans and women in her writings. And one moving example that combines both of those interests is this excerpt from her poem, The Slave Mother. He is not hers, although she bore for him a mother's pains. He is not hers, although her blood is coursing through his veins. He is not hers, for cruel hands may rudely tear apart the only wreath of household love that binds her breaking heart. And of course, speaking of the tragedy of the forced dissolution of black slave families. So I really wanted to include some prison literature. Many of us have shared memes about how quarantine feels like prison, but there is an actual genre of people who write from prison. And there are sadly many examples, some of them excellent that I could have chosen. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, One day in the life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Raise your hand if you're familiar with either of those. Excellent. I settled on Beruz Buchani and his book, No Friend But the Mountains. Uh, Beruz Buchani is a Kurdish Iranian journalist, is meaning very current guy, still very active and very writing, human rights defender, writer, and film producer. He was held in the Australian run Manus Island Detention Center in Papua New Guinea from 2013 until it closed in 2017. His crime basically, he's an illegal immigrant. So while escaping Iran, uh, his boat of asylum seekers was intercepted by the Royal Australian Navy. And eventually, after spending time in the detention center, uh, he was granted refugee status, status in New Zealand in July of 2020. So we're talking like three months ago. Uh, Buchani is to become the senior adjunct research fellow at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. So I picked him of all the prison literature writers because of the fascinating way in which he wrote. Uh, his book, No Friend But the Mountains, was written on a mobile phone using WhatsApp and smuggled out of Manus Island as thousands of PDF files. So basically, he texted an entire book. And because of the way it was texted, it has the feel where some places it's more prosy and some places it's more poetry-like. It was translated from Persian into English and published in 2018. I chose Buchani as an excellent example of the determination to write even when it's illegal. And so here is an example from his poem, The Black Kite. It breaks free, dances toward the ocean, flies far <laughs> and again farther until no one can see it. The youth stare into the empty sky after their impossible dream. And I just couldn't do this workshop without a shout out to Tolkien. Tolkien is most famous for writing Lord of the Rings. Any Lord of the Rings lovers in here? Hooray! <laughs> Spike has two hands down, or up, I mean. Uh, also The Hobbit. Uh, Tolkien reluctantly enlisted in World War I. While waiting to be oh. summoned to his unit, he wrote a poem about his experiences called The Lonely Isle. In 1916, he contracted trench fever. While recovering, he began to work on the Book of Lost Tales and the Fall of Gondolin. In these books, we can see Tolkien attempting to write his own mythology, and some of these names and stories feed into the mythology of Middle-earth later on. And it really, a lot of us, when we think of what Tolkien is famous for, it's his intense, really in-depth world building. Uh, we can see him during the war, he's writing for escapism and to process his experience. After the war, his experiences of World War I are still influencing Lord of the Rings. Please note, I am not saying allegory. <laughs> he was very clear, I am not writing an allegory. But we do see uh, the influence. For example, in real life, Tolkien lost several childhood friends and most of his unit in the war. 
Uh, the war threw lots of young men together, regardless of social class or of background. Uh, we can see that reflected in the Fellowship of the Ring and the theme of carrying on when all seems lost. And personally, uh, those scenes where Frodo and Sam are trudging through Mordor, and it's just so hard to take another step through this barren land and the weight, like that, that would seem to me like a soldier trudging through no man's land, that barrenness. And so we still see Tolkien in some way using his writing years later to work through some of those wartime experiences. So I wanted to pick a uh, poem from Tolkien because he stuck a bunch of poems in his works. And so here is one. This one's from The Hobbit from the Misty Mountains. The mountain smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet, beneath the moon. All right, next section. We have heard some really challenging <laughs> stories and I hope none of you have really heavy things to go through like we've been talking about. But next we're gonna talk about how to respond if you're in a creative slump. Yes, honey. You just froze apparently. Oh, can you see me now? Can you yeah, see me you're fine now. Excellent. Okay. Um, we're going to talk next about how to respond if you are in a creative slump. Um, show of hands, who is actually writing more during 2020? Okay. Show of hands, who is writing less? Who is writing about the same? Okay. Very interesting. We're going to talk about slumps because at some time or another, you're going to go through a slump. <laughs> and so this is useful to have just a deeper bag of tricks for how to respond. First is the question, human first or artist first? The human first approach to handling stress and adversity means that first you must tend to your needs as a human being before you can find in yourself the energy or creative resources to write or produce art. The artist first approach to handling stress and adversity means that you are using your art to restore yourself and become that healthy, fully functioning human being again. These are not mutually exclusive. You do not have to pick type A or type B. Four. All right, let's talk. In the chat box, go ahead and write, what do you do to take care of your human side? So for this, I don't want you to answer anything to do with writing or painting. I want you to think about things like, oh, I garden, I take a long walk, I listen to relaxing music. What do you do to take care of your human side? Go ahead and write that in the chat box. If you would prefer to speak aloud, just go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you can do me a favor, honey, and as the, the chats roll in, can you summarize a few coming in? <coughs> um, sure. Deborah um, references Transcendental Meditation. Mm. Um, Nancy runs and swims. Um, George does gardening and photography. Alice cooks comfort foods. Um, Dennis um, fishes, magnet fishing as well. Um, Caroline plays her guitar, Marlene music, reading and cooking, Caroline um, turn on music and dance, love that, Linda Eden walk, garden and read, um, Caroline walks in the nearby woods, Chuck uh, made it a point to spend more time with your wife, God love you sir, um, 5903, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not sure who that is, Observe Thank Nature on his or her porch and takes walks. Mary, listen to country music, play with the, play with the dog, or take a walk. You all sound like very healthy people. Good coping skills. That's great. Excellent. Um, but also, what are some solutions to when you're in that creative slump that are artist first? Uh, one of them is to seek out the writing community. 
So this could be a club, which means Poetry. it's time for a shameless plug for PoetrySocietyOfIndiana.org. Be sure to fill out your membership forms and pay your dues. <laughs> um, but yeah, a club, a conference, a writing partner. There are socially distant options, such as meeting outdoors was referenced this morning. Meeting over Zoom like we're doing today or over email. Mary Couch has been emailing Warren Jones for years, as far as I know, because they are writing partners and that's why they win everything. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and I also was struck by this quote. I did an interview of Ben and Millie, who some of you know from Up Elwood Way, and they together, they're cousins and they're writing partners and they write together. And I was interviewing them about a new book they had. And I said, well, what do you do if you have writer's block? And they looked stumped and they said, well, you know, with a writing partner, there's no what? such thing as writer's block. And that kind of blew my mind, but they described it. And they're like, yeah, when one of us is stumped, the other one will say something that they're thinking about, and then we just get ourselves out of it. And I'm like, that could have a lot of good practical applications. So maybe part of the solution is to find yourself a writing partner. Um, it's also okay to just get an accountability partner who knows nothing about your craft, but just can check in, hey, how's your writing going? Tell me about an idea you're working on. Um, and a coping mechanism that has been huge for me is trying to support the writing of others. Sometimes if I can't think of a thing to write that's original, being able to say, hey, send me your short poems. I'll put them to a pretty picture and put it on Facebook. It just delights my heart. It makes me appreciate your words in a new way, see something beautiful and make me feel like, oh, I'm giving them a bigger platform. And so that's another way of coping. Next mechanism. Sarah, I just want to say real quick. Yes. When, when you do that, <clears throat> you do it so beautifully that you are creating art uh, by, you know, putting together the images and the words, even if they're other people's words, you're still creating art, whether you think you are or not. Uh, the rest of us recognize that you have created something beautiful and original uh, yourself. You did that with, with the words of others and everything. And we really appreciate that. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Alice. It is a lot of fun. So again, shameless plug for send me your beautiful short poems. <laughs> I, I would love to have this experience of being able to combine those with, with some art. Um, another technique for getting out of a slump is to just hit the sleep button. Um, our adversities just wear us out. We need some rest. But also your brain is wired to solve problems in its sleep. There's different types of brain waves, and we know that theta waves, they're really good problem-solving waves, and you have them right when you fall asleep and right when you wake up. Um, sleep also, part of the REM cycle, helps to consolidate, reorder, organize, and strengthen memories. So that last dream you had about knitting spaghetti noodles together, uh, that was your brain rearranging and sorting <laughs> and helping you problem-solve. Oh. Oh. Um, and thus it's great for creativity to just get a little bit of sleep. And here is a real life example of sleep and problem solving and creativity. In 1920, oh. scientist Otto Loewe woke up with an important idea. He wrote it down on a piece of paper, went back to sleep. He couldn't read his scribbles the next day, but luckily he had the same dream the next night. And it was the design of a simple experiment that eventually uh, proved something that Lowy had been processing and hypothesizing for a long time, that nerve cells communicate by exchanging chemicals or neurotransmitters. And the confirmation of that idea earned him a Nobel Prize in medicine in 1936. Now, I have had my own real life experience of this. One morning, I dreamed a crochet pattern for a strawberry basket. This did not win me a Nobel Prize but I had strawberries all summer long. <laughs> uh, your next getting out of a creative slump. And some of you referenced this already. I heard Caroline reference this one, um, several others of you to get moving. And by get moving, it could be a walk. Just 12 minutes of walking increases the blood flow to the brain. It boosts your mood in a measurable way. Um, getting moving also usually comes with a change of scenery, which can be stimulating. It is socially distant approved. <laughs> so it's one of the okay things for us right now. 
And just forward movement also sends a signal to your brain that you're making progress. So sometimes I don't drive or I don't walk, but I drive and just feeling the corn fields, those golden Indiana corn fields go past and feeling myself moving forward. I'll get like a little tape recorder and make brainstorming writing notes. And I really have good brainstorming moments then because I feel the physical progress. This works for other half mind activities that get your body moving, but only consume half your brain, such as lawn mowing, folding laundry, dicing up vegetables. Those half mind activities are also putting you in that theta wave zone. And that's that same one used for problem solving as you fall asleep and wake up. Oh, and beautiful quote here. Any motion whatsoever beats inertia because inspiration will always be drawn to motion. Yeah. Next up is to create a pocket. And by a pocket, what I mean is a space that isn't conducive to creativity. So what is gone from your life in the middle of your crisis that used to be there to help you write? Is it time to yourself? Is it <clears throat> stimulation from the outside world? A room of one's own. Can you put it back even momentarily? And do you need to change or clean your writing environment? This is not a picture of my actual writing desk. I was too embarrassed to show a picture of my actual writing desk, but it is not all that far off either. <laughs> And so sometimes just cleaning up, freshening up your writing space can help you be more uh, productive. Sometimes when I try to sit down to write, even if I have all the time in the world, if I came in and I took off my shoes and socks and threw them on the floor, all I can do is stare at those socks like two little dehydrated snakes and, and I can't write until they're cleaned. Um, but you can also do things like uh, add maybe... Uh, thematic inspiration. So um, I don't know if you can, can see my little real life head, but I am holding up a Starbucks cup here. And uh, I just happened years ago to really like the quote on it. Um, and it became kind of a, a theme for when I was writing a novel. And so I have had this cup for more years than I care to admit. <laughs> and, and it still stays on my writing desk and I won't allow people to throw it out because it is inspiration for me and my space. It helps to have a designated space for writing. Uh, and that's in part because we will associate repeated activity with being in that space. For example, some people say, don't watch TV in your bedroom because then you'll associate it with watching TV instead of sleeping. Um, we also know that Alcott had kind of a, a writing tower. What did she call it, hon? Her garret. Her garret. Um, we know that Jane Austen had the tiniest little writing desk and her nieces and nephews knew to stay away from her when, when Aunt Jane is at her writing desk. Uh, and also just creating that little pocket maybe outside of your home when it is safe and you're comfortable doing so, uh, such as, for example, J.K. Rowling. We know that she went to a coffee shop to write parts of Harry Potter. Next up, try on something new for size. Uh, this could be trying a different medium, a different genre, uh, maybe a completely other type of art. I got into some uh, visual art over the winter and combining that visual art with my writing led to something really new and interesting. Maybe you make an idea board and you can do this physically uh, or you can do it with tech out there on services like Pinterest. It's very easy to clip and gather ideas that are nice and pretty and organized online. Uh, journaling, we mentioned, verbal or recording. And may I also give a shout out to Mary Couch. She gave us a beautiful handout of poetic forms a few years ago. If you still have that handout, get it back out and try a new form. Or if you lost that handout or you're new, uh, go to shadowpoetry.com or any of those similar sites that can show you a new challenging form. Next for getting out of a creative slump is to just never stop learning. Uh, we got into writing most likely because we love reading. Writing is what inspired, or reading is what inspired us to write. So take the time to consume writing. Uh, take workshops. Um, 
I love YouTube because if you go deep into it, there are so many rabbit holes. You can go into analyzing your favorite works. I have watched probably 50 videos on Jane Eyre in the last six months. And then just researching a topic that you'd like to write about or just researching a topic and maybe incidentally it will lead to you being inspired to write something. And next is to write something bad by which I mean write anything, <laughs> even if it's bad. It can be complete and utter dross. Just get your fingers moving. Uh, start out with, I don't know what to write today. Kind of like Virginia Woolf did. And then tell us about it. <laughs> tell us why you can't write. A uh, stream of consciousness is allowed. For example, um, I set a timer because having, you know, a little bit under the wire gets your adrenaline going and your heart going and blood flow going and that can help your writing. So I set a timer and I wrote, I don't know what to write today. My laptop feels stuck permanently in gum like a shoe. Have you ever gotten your shoe stuck in gum? I have. It was gross and took forever to scrape off. I remember the pink smushed into the treads. Now, is that going to get me a pulsar? No. But maybe one image from it like, ooh, I can see in my mind the pink in the treads. Maybe that image is going to inspire another thought and get me moving again. Maybe you edit someone else's works. Maybe you edit your own works and write it from a different point of view or a different style. You have a prose poem, you put it into a rhyme scheme, you have a rhyme scheme poem, you break it into something free verse. Also writing small. So you're stumped on your novel, so you write a poem. You're stumped on your epic poem, so you write a haiku. And this is good for many reasons. One is that it hones everything down to the essence. It's really healthy for editing. Um, really gets your chops there. And next is to write by hand, even to the point of you copy somebody else's words down by hand. The physicality of that triggers different parts of your brain. You'll be forced to slow down and really appreciate somebody else's style. And also it's just motion. And as we read, motion and activity attract motion and activity. Let's talk. So we know that uh, our adversities suck away a lot of our energy and often suck away a lot of our time. The pandemic is a little unusual in that some of us have more time on our hands. <laughs> but I would say a lot of the adversities in our life suck away our time. So how do you find time to write when you have no time? As you're writing, uh, one example I have is for years, breakfast is writing time. And so I get up early for the sheer pleasure of being able to have my nice apple and sinful things to dip the apple in for breakfast and be able to slowly type. Some days it's only 25 minutes. Some days it's a couple hours. It depends. And honey, as they roll in, would you mind uh, kind of announcing what a few of those are in summary? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a comment. Chuck, did you have a comment? <clears throat> No, 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 I just unmute. I was anticipating, but no. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, Deborah gets up basically most time of morning. Can you um, hear Spike? Deborah gets up basically when monks do every morning um, to give herself time for coffee, thinking, reading, and writing. Another person says early, early morning coffee. Early, early morning coffee, yes. Cheap legal stimulants. Alice. <laughs> I kind of do the opposite. I use my early morning um, when my eyes and my brain are fresh. That's when I do all my computer work for community education arts, answer emails, all that kind of stuff. And then as the day goes by and I'm, I'm you know, more into uh, like resting on the couch or not doing so much of what I consider my my brainy work, uh, that's when my poetry writing seeps in more because I feel like it happens because I've, I've finished my jobs of the day kind of a thing and I'm relaxed and um, in whatever thoughts I have that are percolating are more my internal process, my emotions, uh, and that turns into poetry that way. Excellent. Yes, go ahead, honey. Um. Um, some people are talking about waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to sleep. There was um, 
a study done especially of medieval life and science has confirmed this that people used to sleep in two shifts and they would use this middle of the night time to pray to write to conduct business even to garden um, and I did include a link to an article about it above. I mentioned Chuck because he mentioned it. And also George, I noticed you mentioned it. Um, waking up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and writing. Great. So the science supports it. Yeah. I don't actually write until I get up the next morning, but I sure have a whole lot of stuff built up in my head by, by the time I get up. It's, it's, it's very rare that I will just get out of bed and go right because I've built up too much, but you know, I'll have the, the germ or whatever. And I may have fretted on that for two hours in bed before I get up, but it's very rare. I actually get out of bed in the middle of the night to go write something, but I spend a lot of time, you know, playing with ideas and, and letting the words flow in my, in my head while I'm still laying there and, you know, can't go back to sleep and that this I'm kind of consumed by whatever it is that I'm thinking about. So, you know, I have written a few poems where I got to the point where I just had to get up and, and go write them. But uh, mostly uh, with the morning stuff, it's just, it's more like the inspiration and I'll have, I may only have, by the time I sit down to write, I may only have one line or one phrase that's that's ready to get me started but then but then normally i do once i'm up i th i think if i don't sit down and write now i'm going to lose it or i i won't feel like taking the time or whatever so mm -hmm. i personally tend to write mostly in the mornings like that um but i, think, uh, oh. I was going to say i think that can you hear me yeah okay <clears throat> uh, like chuck i i uh well in a dream or in a sort of a waking moment, or even sometimes when I'm driving the car, I have what I'm sure are Pulitzer Prize winning ideas that are lost before I get to the next stoplight or lost by the time I wake up. And um, I'm not real good at like grabbing a smartphone in the middle of the night and finding some place on it to write a phrase, but I wish I was. I actually did that last week. I, uh, put something in um, the notes uh, app on my phone uh, laying in bed <laughs> and my eyesight isn't very good. And I, so I wake up and come to my computer the next morning, you know, in the morning and I've got to figure out what the words were <laughs> because, because I, I couldn't type them correctly. <laughs> so the first step is deciphering uh, what I tried to write. Mm -hmm. It would not be uncommon for me to uh, go around the house or check a coat pocket uh, for a purple crayon writing on a dirty napkin. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it comes to you and you're driving down the road or you see something or, you know, it's just like three or four words come pouring into your head and, and you know it, it, it's the seed for something. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever whatever's handy whatever, a bill, you know, like I said, a dirty napkin, you know, whatever, there are all these prompts all throughout and opportunities all throughout the day. Um, so I, I think I don't ever really put a pen down, you know, <laughs> thinking about when do I write the best? Well, I write most in the morning, but I'm always writing. I, I don't really uh, not write, except for when I sleep. I'm a very, very good sleeper. <laughs> I'm serious about my sleep. <laughs> Caroline, did I see you had a comment as well? Um, well, I originally answered on the comments, the chat section that I write a lot at night because I'm sort of a night person and that's kind of my time when I'm not obligated to do other things. But I got thinking a lot of times it'll be the end of a dream or just a thought that comes in my head in the morning when I'm waking up and I go, oh, I got to get up and write it down now while I still remember it. It'll like be something that occurs to me. It's not necessarily a line, but it's usually a theme or a subject or a, a kind of a visual that I had from probably a dream, the last dream before I woke up. Mm -hmm. That'll give me a good start prompt for a poem. Yeah. I'm hearing from a lot of you the value of 
having your butterfly net always in your pocket. So when the beautiful idea goes, you are ready to snag it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to, could I mention one other thing? Yes, please. I'm so overjoyed that my nine-year-old granddaughter is starting poetry classes with me once a week. She does in-home online classes. So to give her extracurricular, I started when I was nine with writing poetry and she loves just writing on her own and kind of more like novel stuff. But we did, I told her it was going to be a word found. It was like a scavenger hunt. We we're going to hunt for words and just go around the block. We didn't get down two houses. And she said, oh, I have a poem already. I said, what well, is write Write words, what you see, and then write a phrase or whatever you, and by the time we came back, she had something she had written. So she's understanding instead of stop, drop, and roll, stop, look, and listen. Yeah. And actually during our walk, I stopped, dropped, and rolled just to kind of imprint that in her mind because I'm the crazy grandma anyway. <laughs> It'll be a poet. I think she'll probably end up coming to our NI Poets Club. Her mom already asked, can she join that or can she start coming? So we don't have an age limit. I guess we're going to have a nine-year-old in there, soon to be 10. That's great. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, yes, honey. Okay, that's fine. Uh, welcome, Julie. We know you're here. Sorry I'm being a little bit long-winded, but we have some great comments that we're getting through. Uh, we don't have too many slides left, so um, I encourage you to continue this conversation even after we're done with this workshop and share what else do you do to inspire yourself to write after a slump. Feel free to go ahead and drop it into the chat box or just to share with each other. I'm happy to even just do a series of Facebook posts or a blog post about this. I want to leave you with this saying, no emotion is permanent. I heard this recently and I wish I had written down the lady's name, but it was in reference to the stress that we're all feeling in 2020. And this can be an unsettling statement because it means that, that maybe that moment of bliss we're having isn't going to, to last forever, but it's also reassuring that this feeling of crisis that we might have during adversity also is not going to last forever. And I would say the same is true of our creative rhythms, that if you are in creative winter right now, you are not stuck there permanently. I wish you good luck on your writing journey. Uh, you are free to reach out to me. I do have a website, sarahemorin.com, but really I encourage you to go to our ceaarts.com website. And if you go there, you will see lots of opportunities uh, for getting involved with the, the nonprofit that Alice and I run for uh, submitting to the Polk Street Review, being part of our podcast, having your stuff exhibited online. We have a literally inspired art exhibit coming up in early November. So please visit us, visit us there and be part of that. And again, I would love to feature you on our website, on the Premier Poets Corner. So again, especially small poems, I would love for you to send those to me. There is my email address, but again, Good luck on your writing journey and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Sarah. It was fantastic as usual. Good, good job. Very, very happy. Oh, thank you.